Bibles, if you would like, to Romans chapter 6 this morning. Just going to look quickly at one verse as more of a backdrop to this morning's consideration. Romans 6, looking at verse 4. If, you look, if you're in the Pew Bible, that's on page 1199. Paul's talking in this passage about uh, the baptism really of the Spirit, the baptism that the Spirit does who baptizes us into Christ so that we have a participation in His death and resurrection. And so this is really the thing signified, as we say. It's this baptism to which water baptism in one sense points. And so we'll be looking at this as a connection point. This is the Word of God. Let us look at verse 4 together. Paul says, We were... Buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Amen. Thus saith the Lord. Well, as most of you know, of course, we have been slowly building uh, on the doctrine of baptism, using our little children that God brings into our midst uh, by grace. Each time we have a baptism, slowly adding to a larger picture of the doctrine of baptism. I mentioned some time ago then that the doctrine of baptism has three parts, uh, guilt, grace, and gratitude. You might remember that I preached on Psalm 51, verses 1 to 6, to address the first part by showing that baptism is at root a confession of our guilt. When we present ourselves or our children for baptism, we come with the words unclean on our lips. We come to the waters of baptism because we know that we are defiled by sin and we know that we are in need of a cleansing that only God can give. So we seek washing nowhere else but in the waters of baptism, in the God of that baptism. We know that we are defiled. We know that God alone can do it. And we're looking that He do that work of cleansing, a cleansing that is signified and sealed to us and sealed to our faith in baptism. And even though our small children, of course, are too young to have committed any actual sin, yet we believe what the Bible tells us in places like Job 14, Romans 3, Romans 5, and Ephesians 2, where the Bible declares to us so plainly that our children are guilty in Adam. And therefore, they are justly subject to, by nature to the wrath of God. And so as we present our children for baptism, we're confessing and acknowledging as their parents their natural guilt as sinners. We're confessing their need to be born again by grace. And at the same time, we're directing them, though they cannot perceive it at that moment, but later as they grow to understand, we're directing them by their baptism to look for their salvation outside of themselves to the triune God into whose name they were baptized in their youth, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then I preached on Acts 22, verse 16 to address the second part of baptism by showing that baptism also preaches to us of the grace of God. And it signifies and seals the washing away of all our sins through Jesus Christ as Savior. So if you look at those two parts, in the first part of baptism, we're taught to look to ourselves. And what do we see? But we see our guilt. We see our misery. We see our pollution. We see our need as sinners. And in the second part of baptism, we're taught to look away from ourselves. We're taught to look to God. And who is it that meets us in this sacrament and baptizes us into His name? But the triune God. The Father who loves us, the Son whose blood can wash sinners clean, and this Holy Spirit who actually washes us clean and then brings to our hearts the assurance and the peace that we have indeed been washed by the blood of Christ. So that together with the Lord's Supper, the two sacraments of the New Testament, the sacraments don't say to those of us who are around us, look at me, look at what I'm doing to reconcile myself to God, I'm getting baptized. Instead, in the sacraments, it is God who says to us, Look at me. Look at what I have done to reconcile you to myself 
in my Son. Look at what I have done as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to give myself to you. There's a lot more that I really would like to say about that second part of baptism, the grace of God that it preaches. This morning, I want to introduce the third part so that we can at least close the circle. We might revisit some of these things later. The third principal part of the doctrine of baptism then is gratitude. Because this ordinance involves our response to God, as we've already seen in our confession of faith earlier. In this sacrament, God comes to us as a promising God. He comes to us knowing the sinners that we are, knowing the guilt we are under, but He comes to us all the same. And He comes not in judgment. These are not waters of judgment. He comes to us in grace. And He comes with a sacrament, as you've confessed already, what is a sacrament? He comes with a sacrament to signify what He's done to wash us in His Son and to tangibly seal the assurance of that washing unto our weak faith, calling to us not to doubt, but only believe. So that in baptism, then, the gospel of God's forgiveness in Christ is made visible to all who look upon that sacrament in faith by saying to them, just as water washes the impurity of the body, so the blood of Jesus Christ has washed away the impurity of your soul. And so it is to so great, so grand, and so gracious a reality that baptism calls us to respond. And so this morning, I want to say a few words about what that response should look like. Let me begin by making sure that there's no confusion when I talk about our responding to God, as if there's some synergism here. God does His part, we do ours in order to be saved. I want to take that away from your mind. Let me remind you that in its establishment, The covenant of grace is entirely one-sided in that it comes entirely from God, not from man. And this is laid out in all of Scripture. Speaking of the grace of salvation that comes to sinners, God says in Romans 10 verse 20, I have been found by those who did not seek me. Speaking of the Gentiles. I have been found by those who did not seek me. Notice he says, I've shown myself to those who did not ask for me. And of course, in Romans 5, Paul says, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were still sinners, Paul says, Christ died for us. Then in John 1, we read that Christ came to a world that not only did not receive Him, but killed Him, because He wasn't the kind of Savior for whom they were looking. Even as far back as Genesis 12, when God came in grace to Abram, in Ur of the Chaldees, Abram was an idolater, Stephen tells us. In his father's house. Abram was neither looking to be done with idolatry. Nor was he looking to have Yahweh for his God. And yet God came to him. Just as he came to you and to me one day. And God said with the efficacy and the power that only God can exercise in his words. And with the same efficacy and power that God exercised when by his own words. He made the world and all that is in them in Genesis 1. He said, Abram, Abram, go out from your father's house to a land that I will show you. To which Abram suddenly responds, yes, Lord. And he went. So the point is this. If any of us here today know the grace of God in Jesus Christ, and for all of us here who have had the waters of baptism grace our brow, It's only because God came to us. Not because we sought out God. Not because we went looking for Yahweh. Not because we chose God to be our God. It's only because God chose us to be His child. It's because as Ezekiel 16 says, so graphically, God freely and sovereignly came to us in the defilement and misery of our sinful estate and said to us, Live. Because as it's so clearly stated in 1 John 4, if we love him, it's only because he first loved us. And so what I want you to understand here is this. The covenant of grace is established monergistically from God's side. 
as a purely free, sovereign, gracious act. The Father in love elects to salvation. The Son in love merits salvation for them. And then the Spirit in love applies that salvation to all the elect. But having said that, Once God's freely and sovereignly made the covenant with us, once God has freely and sovereignly come to us, it then becomes two-sided because it includes admonitions to obedience and it calls for an appropriate response on our part. We see this so clearly in Exodus 20 when God first came to Israel in free sovereign grace and then he called them to respond in the light of it. In Exodus 20, verse 2, God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And it's only then that he says to them, you shall have no other gods before me, and etc. And we see the same thing from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4, verse 1. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. The call came first, the walk comes second. In the opening of Colossians 3, Paul says something similar. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. The rising rising up in Christ came first. The life comes first. The putting to death comes second. And of course, Paul speaks in this way because he's echoing not only Exodus chapter 20, but he's also echoing John 10, 16, where the Savior himself says, My sheep hear my voice. First we're made sheep, and then we are able to hear. So again, the point here is this. When God comes to us in covenant, he comes freely. And he comes in grace, calling us to acknowledge him alone as our God and to rest entirely on what he has done to reconcile us to himself. We don't earn a right to be in the covenant of grace because God comes to us freely. And there's nothing we can or even need to do to add to the workings of the covenant because he's already done it all in Christ. This is a covenant in which God says, look away from yourself unto my son. Look away from anything you've done or could possibly do. And look unto what I have done. This is that that humility and that recognition of unworthiness and undeserving. This is the empty hand of faith. When God calls us to come to him, he says, let everything go and leave everything behind. Bring nothing but your own sinful self. Indeed, the only thing we bring is need. And it's a recognition of that need that is the very spark, the beginnings of the sparks of salvation. God's already done it all. We're simply being called to accept the terms of the covenant and to believe and rest in its sufficient, sufficiently, sufficiency to save us. God is offering to us in His Son a whole salvation by way of a whole Christ And this is what makes the terms of the covenant of grace, though absolutely free, so difficult. Because we want to add to it. We want to bring something of our own. We want to contribute. We want recognition. And to come to Christ is to deny all recognition. And rather instead to give all glory to Christ. God calls us to see what we are. To recognize again that guilt. And that it's all by grace. And now the third part. Will you come? So what's all this talk of our response then? Well, with all that it entails, and even with the obedience that characterizes it, which hopefully we'll look at 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 another time, our response is all wrapped up in this one word. Gratitude. At the heart of which, at the heart of which, is our return of love. For a God who so freely and fully has loved and saved us in Christ. In other words, we're responding to love with love. So that as John says, if we love him, it's because he first loved us. And so you see, this is what's on display in the sacraments. 
and in the sacrament of baptism in particular, which is the sacrament of our initiation into the covenant community of God's believing people. When the waters of baptism grace our brow, the gospel, the good news of the covenant is being preached to us. To us as the recipients of baptism and to us as a church who witnesses the baptism. The waters of baptism say this, God is coming to us sovereignly by his own free choice. God is coming to us freely because we can't do anything to earn the covenant. God is coming to us graciously because we've done nothing to deserve it. God is coming to us mercifully because we deserve his judgment instead. And God is coming to us fully because all the cleansing, all the justifying, all the sanctifying, all the redeeming work of which baptism speaks has already been done entirely and solely in Christ. Again, that second part of baptism to where it calls us to look away from ourselves to a whole Christ who brings a whole salvation, the grace of God. And so when those waters of baptism go over our heads, God is saying to us, I am your God. I and no other. I've done everything for you in my son Jesus Christ. No work of yours needs to be added to it. And this sacrament is the sign and the seal of my promise to you that all is yours by faith in him. Will you believe it? Will you accept it? Will you follow me? That's the sermon of baptism. That's the preaching of the sacrament of baptism. So what does this response of gratitude actually look like? Well, essentially it has two parts. Acceptance and obedience. We'll save obedience for another day. Let's look at acceptance. When God does the gracious work of salvation in our hearts, causing us to believe and to embrace Jesus Christ as he's offered to us in the gospel and preached to us in our baptism. And it should go without saying that God doesn't always do that work at the moment of our baptism. But when God does it, the first response he enables us to make is acceptance, the acceptance of faith. We hear the gospel preached. We see it displayed in the sacraments. And by the grace of God, we assent to it and we accept it with the response of faith. And in all of that, what is God doing? Well, God's doing a tremendous amount. God is breaking our bond with Adam, and He's uniting us to His Son. God removes us from the covenant of condemnation in Adam, and He places us in the covenant of grace in Christ. He removes that heart of stone, and He gives us a heart of flesh, malleable in His hands. He removes that enmity that Paul talks about, that was in our hearts toward Him. And he plants faith and love there instead. And in the place of our natural death and sin, he gives us his Holy Spirit and with him a new life in Christ. And he opens, all of a sudden, he opens the eyes of our heart to see the sufficiency and the suitability of Jesus Christ as a Savior for our souls. We see him in a way we never saw him before. A beauty we can never perceive. So that with the new life that God has given us, And the new grace given to us with open arms, with open hearts, we respond to the gospel of free free grace in Jesus Christ. And we say, I believe. I surrender to the terms of the covenant of God. I take Christ for my Savior. I call His Father my Father. I call Christ my Lord and King. I call the Holy Spirit my sanctifier and counselor. And I look for salvation in no other because I have all I need in the God of my baptism. And whether we come to faith before or after our baptism, this believing acceptance has six key characteristics that we can highlight, and I'll give you these briefly. First of all, we accept the covenant knowingly. In other words, we accept a Christ as he is offered to us in the gospel and preached to us We accept Him as a Savior for our lost souls and as a Lord of our lives. 
We accept Him because we've come to know what we are as sinners. We've come to know what we deserve at God's hands. We come to know and understand how we'll fare if we continue without Christ. We've come to see and know who God is, who Christ is, and what He has done to reconcile sinners like us to God. In other words, saving faith As a response to the covenant of grace, saving faith is neither ignorant nor blind. We accept a Christ made known to us by the covenant. We accept the Christ preached to us by word and sacrament. Secondly, we accept the covenant willingly. Psalm 110 verse 3 says, God makes us willing in His day of power. And that's just how we come. We're glad to turn our backs on our old way of life. We're glad to be delivered from Satan's grip. We're glad to leave the world as our home and haunt. We're glad to leave our lusts and cling to none but God for life, for joy, for happiness, for freedom. We don't embrace Christ against our will. God does something to the will and He changes us so that we long for, desire, and freely lay hold of Christ. We come willingly. Thirdly, we come humbly. We come to God with our heads down because we have nothing to command. We have nothing to commend us but our sins and our need. We bring empty hands. We bring a broken heart. We bring a shameful past. We bring a guilty soul. We bring a defiled record. We bring an unworthy person. We've got nothing. We know that God has called us, so we do come but we come in humility because we know that we have nothing to be proud of and because we know that we are as guilty as sin. But again, we come. We come because God calls us. We come because God says He knows it all anyway. And He says He's also made provision for us to be washed. He's made a way through His Son for us to be reconciled. He's made a way through the cross and the empty tomb for us to be redeemed. And so we come in hope and in faith and in gratitude. We come. We come with the humility of the unworthy and the undeserving, but mysteriously also we come with the boldness of the trusting and the believing because God has spoken and we believe His Word. And therefore, fourthly, we come believingly. We come trusting in the gospel that was preached to us. It has been proclaimed to us. We have heard news of a gospel about a Savior that can save sinners. We've been told of a fountain that can wash the guilty white as snow. It's been preached to us, this gospel about a mediator that reconciles sinners to God. We've heard about an advocate that clothes his clients in righteousness before presenting them to the judge. It's been preached to us about a strong tower that protects its refugees from the wrath of God like Noah's Ark protected all who were in it from that terrible flood. We've heard, preached, a king that subdues the enemies, both without and within. And so we come. We come believing this good news. We come believing the promises which preach it. We cast our souls into the lap of the God whose name backs up this gospel. We come trusting that the God who has made it known is the God who can and will save sinners like us. And of course, fifthly, we accept the covenant and we come to God sincerely. Although we know we have a deceitful heart, the bottom of which we can never reach, yet as much as we know this heart of ours, we know we want nothing more than to enter into an eternal covenant with the God of our baptism. And so we come honestly, sincerely, not hypocritically, not duplicitously. We come genuinely wanting nothing more than the God of our baptism to do His work. And therefore, finally, we come agreeably. And that simply means we take it as it is. We take the covenant of grace as it is. We take the gospel as it is. We take the preaching of this good news as it stands. We take it at face value. We want no negotiation here. We have no terms to set as if we have something to demand or grounds upon which to demand. We have no demands to make. We have no conditions that we want met before we're going to come to God. We take the gospel as it's been proclaimed to sinners. 
We've heard the gospel. We've seen the sign. We've seen the seal. We got the message. And this is our response. We accept the covenant of grace. Let others look for salvation where they will. We come to the God of our baptism. Let others look to whatever means they can. We come to the gospel that was preached from God's holy word. We surrender our head, heart, and hands unto the God of the covenant. We come just as we are, the only way we can come. And we cast ourselves on his mercy. We cast ourselves in this, into the lap of his promises. We rest and we believe in the person and work of his son as our only savior. We embrace Jesus as he's offered in the gospel. And so while the covenant of grace is one-sided in its establishment, it's two-sided in its nature, and that it calls sinners to respond. And that response has these two parts, a believing acceptance and a loving obedience. Again, we don't have time to go into the second part. I'll close with this. As we witness the sacrament of baptism today, we are being called, each of us, we're being called to examine our acceptance of the covenant of grace that is offered to us in the gospel and that is signified and sealed to us in the sacraments and in the sacrament of baptism in particular. This is not a service that we have no interest or investment in because, well, we're not being baptized. Rather, this is, an entire, this is a service that entirely engages our interest that we are very much invested in. Because we will bear witness to this sign, this seal given to our covenant children. And we are being called to look again to the foundations of our own faith. And so I ask you, when you came to God for the salvation that he offers, did you come knowingly? Did you come humbly, willingly, believingly, sincerely, and agreeably? These are important questions because, you see, some take Christ as a stopgap measure to quiet a convicted conscience. Some take Christ because they feel pressured by family or fiancé. Some take Christ with very little sense of guilt or need, but for status or re recognition. Some take Christ deceptively to pull the wool over someone else's eyes. Some take Christ because they, they think in Him they will get health and wealth. Some take Christ hypocritically and half-heartedly. Some take Christ on condition that Christ will overlook certain sins or that Christ will make all their dreams come true. But once, Christ, once they have Christ, they can live as they want for themselves. But I shouldn't have to tell you that none of those is a saving acceptance of the covenant. None of those ways of accepting Christ will give a sinner any participation at all in the work of Christ. And so if there are so many ways of missing Christ, let's say, then the question needs to be brought home to your own heart today. How would you describe your accepting of the covenant of grace? How would you describe your coming to Christ? Was it in the full surrender of a sinner whose only hope for salvation and reconciliation with God was the gospel of Jesus Christ as it was preached in the Bible? Because if it wasn't, then you need to see that today, because it's not too late, you need to see that today you respond to the covenant in a saving manner, believingly accepting Christ as your Savior, looking at last with all your soul and heart and mind to the God of your baptism. Let me close with just a brief word to all our covenant children. Little children, you've been baptized into the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Your baptism with water testifies to you that you were born a sinner and that you need a washing and a cleansing if you're ever going to stand before God acceptably. 
And your baptism also tells you that just as that water washed your head, so God has washed your sins away in his son Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you. And it's by these two messages that your baptism calls to you. It calls to you to believe what it tells you. It calls to you to accept what it shows you. It calls to you to trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and to trust in the washing He gives and to surrender your heart and mind and life to the God of your baptism. And so the question I want to ask you today is this. Have you done that? Will you do that? Just as you weren't too young for God to put His seal on you in your baptism, so you're not too young today to believe and accept it. So I urge you, little children, to look to the God of your baptism and to surrender yourself to Him today. He came to you as your God when He came to you in baptism, when He baptized you in His own name. And in His baptism, He said to you, My child, give me your heart. Little children, let today be the day you say in response, My Lord and my God, here's my heart. Because you gave yourself to me, I give my heart to thee. I take you, God of my baptism, just as you took me, child of your love. People of God, my prayer this day is that the God of our baptism would meet us here today one and all, young and old, and by his grace, enable all of us to renew the vows of our surrender unto him and him alone as our God, our Savior, our Lord. Today, may we know for certain, and may it be the comfort of our souls, that we seek for salvation in no other but in the God of our baptism.